Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series has proved to be a very challenging one on preparation for the end time. And we're lesson number 12 for the, in that series entitled Babylon and Armageddon. This is the lesson for June 23 of 2018. We think you'll enjoy it. As usual, however, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, how kind and considerate it is for you to have given us adequate warning. Those who understand scripture may not be understood by many, but for those who've had some, express, some experience with the Old Testament and understand some of these symbols that are being used, some very clear warnings about what's going to happen at the end of this earth's history. We look down and we realize how many of the things that we expected to see at the end seem to be developing now and we really wonder, are we in fact in the time for preparation for the end time? It could be soon. We ask your the presence that you may guide us in, in, in leading the discussion and in sharing it with all those who are listening that all may be prepared for that day. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. It shouldn't be a surprise to anyone who spent any significant amount of time studying the entire Bible, some parts of the Old Testament, and especially the book of Revelation, that it is full of images and language taken directly from the Old Testament. That made it difficult for some Roman soldier who was guarding John out there in the Isle of Patmos to know exactly what he was talking about. But for those who were already familiar with the biblical languages and images, it was a pretty clear message. So let's look at some of those challenges. The name Babylon, for example, appears six times in Revelation. So when I say Babylon, what's the first thing you think about? Anybody? Or the kingdom of ancient. Yeah, you think of Nebuchadnezzar and the ancient king of Babylon, huh? You think that's what John was talking about? No. No. Don't think so. There is good evidence that he's not talking about the ancient kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar or the, the other generation of Babylonians that lived 1,200 years before, even more than 1,400 years before him. John was using it as a code word for Rome. Uh, we'll look at some of the evidence for that a little bit later. Babylon represented a powerful religious and political entity seeking to crush out Judaism and their religion. Well, what about another very interesting code word, Armageddon? Back to Babylon. Yes, so yeah. ancient Babylon actually tried to crush Jerusalem, yes. mm -hmm. God's kingdom. And is that did why it's used? Did a pretty good job for yeah. a while. Yeah. Yeah. Well, is that why it's used? Probably, yeah. Yeah, but God said that he brought Babylon down. Yeah. To, so, you know, how yep. would that fit? Well, I mean, well... It's a symbol. Yeah, it's a symbol. Mm -hmm. None of these parables or, or symbols aren't supposed to, you know, we say typically to stand on all four legs. You know, you, you, can, you, can, you can carry any parable too far and end up with all sorts of craziness. We don't want to do that. Well, getting back to Babylon, there are six passages in the book of Revelation that refer to Babylon, starting out with 14 verse 8, a very familiar passage, hopefully to Seventh Adventist particularly. A second angel followed the first one saying, she has fallen great, Babylon has fallen. She made all peoples drink her wine, the strong wine of her immoral lust. And then that idea is expanded in chapter 16 verse 19, the great city was split into three parts and the cities of all countries were destroyed. God remembered great Babylon and made her drink the wine from his cup, the wine of his furious anger. And then it says basically the same idea in 17 and 18 and three places in chapter 18. So uh, how do we know what that means? It's clear that God was warning God's, uh, John was warning God's people to get out of Babylon because Babylon is corrupt and will soon fall. While Jerusalem had proven to be a rebellious city, it was always God's plan that the children of Israel centered in Jerusalem 
we're supposed to spread the gospel to all the surrounding world. Do we, what evidence do we have for that? Anybody remember? Well, look, for example, some... Yeah, in Acts, well, uh, Jesus said, you know, beginning in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and even to the uh, uttermost parts of the earth, so... The Old Testament talks about it, too. I don't remember mm -hmm. the exact quotes. Yeah. Je uh, uh, Isaiah 65, verse 19, for example, I myself, God speaking, will be filled with joy because of Jerusalem and her people. There will be no weeping there, no calling for help, and so forth. So God's joy, uh, we, we read about it in Luke 15, comes when people turn back to him from their evil ways. So while Ju Jerusalem had prepared, had been a rebellious city, as we mentioned, by contrast, Babylon has always stood for oppression, violence, and every kind of rebellion against God through deceit and false religion. So look at, for example, Genesis chapter 11, verse 9. The city was called Babylon because there the Lord mixed up the language of all the people, and from there he scattered them all over the earth. And there's a little message here beside Babylon says this name sounds like the Hebrew for mixed up. Okay? How would you like to live in mixed up city? Sound like a good place to live? Well, the Hebrew word for Babel is a word translated in Greek as Babylon. So Babel and Babylon, those are the same depending on which language you're translating from. Now, why do we think it maybe has something to do with Rome, look at 1 Peter 5, verse 13. Now, this is, the, this is the last couple of verses of Peter's first letter to his churches and to the people in, actually, the people in northern, what we would call Turkey today. Your sister church in Babylon, also chosen by God, sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. And if you go over into 2 Peter, you find out that Mark is in Rome. So, um, and Peter was, where, where was it that Peter was crucified upside down? Rome. In Rome, yeah. yeah. So, it's pretty clear. I mean, if you look even this, book, this thing from the, for, from the American Bible Society, they say, as in the book of Revelation, this probably refers to Rome. So, this is not something we dreamed up by ourselves. Okay. Um, what church was Peter talking about? Well, it cannot refer to ancient Babylon because as God predicted to the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 13, 19 through 22, and I think, Carrie, you're going to read that for us. <coughs> yes. Babylonia is the most beautiful kingdom of all. It is the pride of its people. But I, the Lord, will overthrow Babylon as I did Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm. No one will ever live there again. No wandering Arab will ever pitch his tent there, and no shepherd will ever pasture his flock there. It will be a place where desert animals live and where owls build their nests. Ostriches will live there, and wild goats will pr prance th through the ruins. The towers and palaces will echo with the cries of hyenas and jackal. Babylon's time has come. Her days are almost over. So that doesn't sound like a place where God is going to um, put his, his future people, does it? No. Well, we already looked at Revelation 14, 8, but let's look for just a second at Revelation 18, verse 3. Give me just a moment, I'll convince my computer to go there. For all the nations have drunk her wine, the strong wine of her immoral lust, the kings of the earth practiced sexual immorality with her, and the merchants of the world grew, ri grew rich from her unrestrained lust. What in the world is he talking about there? That doesn't sound like a city, does it? Wasn't Babylon the mother of those pagan nations? And all those that came after her were <laughs> pagan, including Rome? And much of Judaism had been infected by paganism. Yep. All that comes from Babylon. Come out of this place of worship. So it should be clear why God wants his people to get out of there. 
it's very clear that God describes Babylon as a sexually immoral entity full of unrestrained lust and riches. It is described as a religio-political compact, compact between an apostate church and the nations of earth. Revelation 17, 5 and Isaiah 23, 15 to 17. So, do we see any kind of collusion? Collusion is a bad word these days, isn't it? Do we see any kind of collusion going on between churches and governments? Not in your face, but it's starting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's more than just starting in some parts of Europe. Yes, yes. So what is the wine of the wrath of her fornication that we read about in Revelation 14, 8? Well, Fred has already helped us there. It must be a re reference to their corrupt practices, their false teachings, their false doctrines of, a, of the, an apostate church. Those false teachings, practices, and doctrines will apparently spread all over the world. Do we see any hint of that going on today? Definitely. Yes. Well, the place where this is most prominently spelled out is in Revelation 18. I'm going to take a moment and read through a few verses there. After this, I saw another angel coming down out of heaven. He had great authority, and his splendor brightened the whole earth. He cried out in a loud voice, She has fallen! Great Babylon has fallen! She is now haunted by demons and unclean spirits. All kinds of filthy and hateful birds live in her. For all the nations have drunk her wine, the strong wine of her immoral lust. The kings of the earth practiced sexual immorality with her, and the merchants of the world grew rich from, from her unrestrained lust. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out, my people, come out from her. You must not take part of her sin, in her sins. You must not share in her punishment, for her sins are piled up as high as, heavens, as heaven, and God remembers her wicked ways. Treat her exactly as she has treated you. Pay her back double for all she has done. Fill her cup with a drink twice as strong as the drink she prepared for you. Give her as much suffering and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. For she keeps telling herself, here I sit, a queen. I am no widow. I will never know grief. Because of this, in one day she will be struck with plagues, disease, grief, and famine, and she will be burnt with fire, because the Lord God who judges her is mighty. The kings of the earth who took part in immorality and lust will cry and keep, weep over the city when they see the smoke from the flames that consume her. They stand a long way off because they are afraid of sharing in her sufferings. They say, how terrible, how awful, this great and mighty Babylon, mighty city Babylon. In just one hour, you have been punished. Now, what do you think it means, just one hour? Short period of time. Yeah? Prophetically, well, it's uh, two weeks. Yeah? If a day is a year. Well... Have we gotten out of Babylon? That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> yes. Well, Revelation 18 is clearly an expansion of Revelation 14.8. Now, it's very interesting, and we don't have time to go through this in detail right now, but there's a great loud voice that proclaims the first message in Revelation 14, but there's an ordinary voice that pro proclaims the second message, and then there's a great loud voice that proclaims the third message. And now we come to Revelation 18, and suddenly the second message is declared with a loud voice again. So apparently, the second message in Revelation 14, God and John knew this is going to be expanded later. So, Fred, I think you have something to say about that. Uh, yeah, I'm going to read from uh, The Great Controversy 389 by Ellen White. Uh, the second angel's message of Revelation 14 was first preached in the summer of 1844, and it then had a more direct application to the churches of the United States, where the warning of the judgment had been most widely proclaimed and most generally rejected, and where the declension in the churches had been most rapid. But the message of the second angel did not reach its complete fulfillment in 1844. The churches then experienced a moral fall in consequence of their refusal of the light of the Advent message, but that fall was not complete. As they had continued to reject the special truth for this time, they have fallen lower and lower. 
Not yet, however, can it be said that Babylon is fallen, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. She has not yet made all nations do this. The spirit of world conforming, conforming and indifferent, indifference to the testing truth for our times exists and has been going, gaining ground in churches of the Protestant faith in all the countries of Christendom. And these churches are included in the solemn and terrible denunciation of the second angel. But the work of apostasy has not yet reached its culmination. Dennis, I think you have some more on that, huh? Yeah. The Bible declares that before the coming of the Lord, Satan will work with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. And they that receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved will be left to receive strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Second Thessalonians 2, 9 through 11. Not until this condition shall be reached and the union of the church with the world shall be fully accomplished through Christendom will the fall of Babylon be complete. The change is a progressive one and the perfect fulfillment of Revelation 14.8 is yet future. Okay, that's great controversy, 389 and 390. Well, will there be any way for us as ordinary people to know when these predictions about Babylon have been fulfilled? What, what, what does the Bible mean by saying, get out of Babylon? Does that mean run to the hills, literally, or? Well, there's a sense in which we should be coming out of Babylon even now. I mean, the messages are, uh, are not something in the future. Their first, second, and third angels' messages have already been proclaimed. And so today is the day of salvation. Mm -hmm. It's not just a matter of, well, I'll think about someday, and if I could predict when in the future this will all happen, then, in fact, I had a, when I was a teenager, I had a friend whose dad had left the family, and he had left the church, and was living a, on a moral life, and um, he told a group of us once, I, I believe just like you, I'll come back when I see it all happening. Mm. And, uh, but he, a few years later, he died of a massive heart attack, so uh, he never got to see those signs, per se. So, mm -hmm. uh, I think we always need to remember today is the day of salvation, and it's not for fear of what's happening there, it's because we love God and that he is worthy to receive glory and honor and riches and power and might and that we can just uh, begin there and, and uh, he, will, he will bring us through. You know, I think, I think it'll happen. I think you'll know when it, after it happens, but you won't know so much when it's going to happen. I see. And maybe you'll know because nobody's responding to the call anymore. No? Okay. So, let's be a little more specific. We're not talking about a Babylon somewhere over in Iraq. Mm. We're talking about Babylon where? Spiritual Babylon. Okay, is that uh, somewhere outside of Los Angeles? or? Well, the visual yeah. is there. The visual is to go back to the Old Testament and watch the Jews leaving Babylon. Mm -hmm. And that's the concept that you'll see with the whole world. They'll be leaving are there that. any people any people in our day that are corrupted by false doctrines and false teachings spreading over the world? Isn't Revelation 13 a parallel to that? Uh, the whole world wondered after, or the whole world worshipped the beast. Exactly. I mean, that's confusion. Mm -hmm. those, that's idol worship. It's a false concept of God. It seems it's relatively simple. And uh, I was just noticing here, you know, talk, we're studying the, the end times. A lot of us ain't going to make the end times. End time could be, for me, about a year and a half ago. A uh, situation can happen, all this stuff. The question is, do we understand the truth about God? Mm -hmm. Okay, That's the only thing you can carry you through to prepare and study all this stuff up. If we don't understand the truth about God, we're just spinning our wheels. And so anyway, I looked at Matthew, excuse me, um, 
John 13 and John 14 and John 16. The purpose of prophecy, is, as I get that out of that, is so that when it happens, you'll know that I'm the one that told you about it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. When it says, um, get out of Babylon, it means we have to get out of the practice of this world. Mm -hmm. It is Babylon practice. Deceitfulness, uh, uh, all, all kinds of, happens. yeah, that is happening in the world. Okay, so the, your, um, uh, the desire of riches in here, so mm. that is also, get out of that, get mm. out of pride, get mm. out of um, selfishness. That the world yes, is full the of, world is practicing. So, now. Yeah. so that is getting out of Babylon, that's their practice. So ancient Judah was given a chance to get out of Babylon. Mm -hmm. How many left? How many went back to Jerusalem? Not very many. No. How many today are going to get out of Babylon? Probably not Unfortunately, very many. Unfortunately, not very oh, many, not, yeah. Oh, what yes. about what we told you, that, that Matthew, get out of uh, Jerusalem, yeah. a certain thing. You know, you got a warning, get out of town. Yeah. And uh, how many of them stuck around and were eating, even eating their kids? Yeah. So. Okay, now we got a bit bigger challenge than, than Babylon and Jerusalem. Those things are pretty straightforward <laughs> compared to the next one. What do we mean when we talk about Armageddon? Well, I mean, Armageddon has come to be a language in the popular yeah. language, popular vocabulary of people today. What does Armageddon mean to the person on the street? A bad end. A oh, bad end, yeah. Bad end. Maybe it's destruction somebody. of the whole earth or something like that. So how did he get that kind of reputation? Misunderstanding of the biblical languages, for one. Well, the Bible does say it's a it's a serious thing. Oh, I understand yeah. that, yeah, but so. but uh, but I've seen guys say, "Oh, it, it was the little that mountain out there, er, er, off of the Valley of Megiddo. It's just a little a, a, a rise on it, the plain of there. Yeah, uh, well, about a couple acres. We could also look at Armageddon as being not a battle so much as a conflict. Mm -hmm. And what is that conflict? It's a conflict between the truth That's and it. those who reject it. Mm -hmm. And there'll be a conflagration there at some point. It could be the great controversy as a whole, but it talks about the final battle of Armageddon. So we have had some interesting discussions in the past about what kind of weapons were used in the battle in heaven. Is that going to be something like the kind of weapons that are used in this battle? It yeah. depends who you talk to. <laughs> not atom bombs, it's not grenades, it's not tanks, it's truth, it's words, it's ideas. When we say a spiritual battle, what does that mean? The decision time. Yes, mm -hmm. battle of the minds. Yeah, it's a battle of the mind. And we're going to see in a moment that clearly before the end of the world, everybody's going to have to be divided into two camps. You're going to be this side, you're going to be on that side. There's not going to be a bunch of people in the middle somewhere trying to decide still which side <laughs> to go to. So what, does it, what would it take to get the whole world to say go this way or that way? Any idea? Well, the whole world uh, means a pretty good percentage of them. And uh, the masses are probably going one direction, what it says there in Revelation 13. And uh, truth is probably the other direction. And uh, you w actually, we will self-select. Mm -hmm. uh, God isn't, isn't making a decision. We're making the decision for or against the way God's universe is meant to run. It sounds, though, that there is a great polarization happening. That's there's right. Not a, yeah. There's not, you know, people in the middle that are kind of on both sides. They go, yeah. So something's, so gonna something's to happen. Gotta happen. going to happen. They have to actively choose. Well, it's, here, it's, not like, it's not like uh, Switzerland, a neutral country. Yeah. No, nobody's, uh, I'm independent, philo philosophic. No, you're going to choose one way or the other, but you will choose. Mm -hmm. Actively or passively. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we should also emphasize that this choice could very well le lead to a, a physical war. Conflagration, <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, it's happened in the past. Yeah. There's, there's a couple of...
passages in the Bible that give us some clues about this Armageddon stuff. The first one is found in Revelation, not the first one, but the one we're going to go look at first was Revelation 12, I'm sorry, Revelation 16, verses 12 through 16. Uh, Gordon, I think that's yours. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. The river dried up to provide a way for the kings who come from the east. Then I saw three unclean spirits that looked like frogs. They were coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. They are the spirits of demons that perform miracles. These three spirits go out to all the kings of the world to bring them together for the battle of the great day of Almighty God. Listen. Wow. Did, wow. No, did you I want to make a comment there? No, no. Okay. Listen, I am coming like a thief. Happy is he who stays awake and guards his clothes so that he will not walk around naked and be ashamed in public. Then the spirits brought the kings together in the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Wow. So one of the first things we see about Armageddon is it comes from what language? Hebrew. 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 It says right there in Hebrew is called Armageddon. So we need to have a look at some Hebrew ideas. So let's go back to the Old Testament. Isaiah 14, verse 13, and going on to 15, I think. Myra, you've got some yeah, stuff on that. The first one is from uh, the New American Standard Bible. It says, But you, quote, Satan, said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will rise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of, the assemb of assembly in the recesses of the north. And then from the Good News Bible, going on from 13 through 15, you were determined to climb up, into he up to heaven and place your throne above the highest stars. You thought you would sit like a king on the mountain in the north where the gods assemble. You said you would climb to the tops of the clouds and be like the mighty, the almighty, but instead, you have been brought down to the deepest part of the world of the dead. Isaiah 14, 13 to 15. Okay. So we noticed, and Myra wisely skipped over the Hebrew there, uh, <laughs> the word for mount of assembly is harmoad. Okay. So that's, that's a clue. And, and my good news Bible there says, calls it the mountain in the north where the gods assemble. So where did that idea come from? Greeks? <laughs> no, it was it was I way before this. them. Oh, yeah. yeah, this. Go ahead. You going to come? Well, back? it's a confusion again. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I forget what I was going to say. But John uh, one and two is similar to the, the yeah. assembly get together, and then uh, again in uh, Psalms eighty two, they get together, and God counsels or teaches. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's an assembly of people who are confused. Yeah. However, in, in these ancient times, the people actually thought that there was some place way up in the north where the gods got together, and that was the assembly. So who would be included in assembly of gods? Those who were confused. <laughs> okay. Well, and not only confused, but trying to confuse other people, right? Of course. Which is the part we're most worried about. So it's quite clear that the transliteration, Armageddon, comes from the Hebrew word har, meaning mountain, and Magadown or Magadao, which could have at least two different meanings. So let's look at some of the possibilities there. Uh, Jim, are you going to help us there? Uh, Magadown or Magadao. Um, verse 12, or cur excuse me, 12 occurrences, the authorized version translates as, translates as Megiddo 11 times and Megiddon or Megiddon, or Megiddon, Megiddon, once, one ancient city of Canaan is assigned to Manasseh and located on the southern rim of the plain of Ezra Dralen, six miles from the Carmel and 11 miles, which is 18 kilometers, from Nazareth. Okay. And as Fred has already pointed out, Megiddo could be it should be, it could be a, 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 um, a translation or transliteration of Megadon, which means a place of crowds. 
there, and that's from enhanced, that's enhanced Strong's lexicon, um, quoted in the Woodside Bible Fellowship. A place of crowds? A place of crowds, a, a place to assemble, a place yeah. of gathering. Now, it, it was probably, those kind of things were probably on a hill where the speaker would be on the top. Possibly. Maybe, and mm -hmm. I mean, how else? They didn't have amplifiers there. No. So, of course, then you have amphitheaters, the opposite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Okay, Connie, you're going to help okay. us there for the second part? For the second part of the name, Magidon, two different deriv 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 derivations have been suggested. Magidon is from the Hebrew Magido, and Magidon, First King 9.15 and Zechariah 12.11, the ancient city of Megiddo, which gave its name to the important pass through the mountains to the southwest, to the valley of Jezreel to the north and northwest, northeast, and to the Gishon, which flows through the valley. Okay, so... If we had a map here of ancient Israel, this would be the, in, in what actually would be Galilee, the northern part of Israel. You'll see that there's a big valley that comes like this, and there's an important another valley that comes, I guess I should do it like this for you, uh, down to the southwest. And then sitting there sort of in the, in the center of that valley, it's, it's a tell. It's not, it's not up on a mountain. In the city of the tell at that key spot. So if, if you're coming from the south and you want to go north, you've got to go that way unless you're going to climb over top of the mountains. Or, or if you're coming from east to west and you want to get out to the, um, to the Mediterranean, you've got to go, either way, you've got to go past Megiddo. So I'm going to read the second possible meaning that Magadon is from Moed, the Hebrew word commonly used throughout the Old Testament for congregation. Exodus 27, 21, 28, 43, 29, 4, 10, 11, 40, 30, 32, etc. So it's used a lot of times in the Old Testament to mean con uh, congregation. And it, there it's talking about an appointed feast where everybody was supposed to gather and for an assembly in the places of the assembly, Lamentations 1, 15, 16, 1, 15 and 2, 6. The first derivation links the composite name Armageddon with the geographical and historical environment of ancient Megiddo. That's one of the possibilities. While the second suggests a possible connection with the great controversy between Christ and Satan. Now let me ask you. As we're coming down to the end of the history of this world, is it more important to know about what's happening in one spot in northern Israel? Is it more important to know about what's going on in the great controversy between Christ and Satan? I don't think we have to guess very long, do we? Well, in Isaiah 14, 13, as Myra read a little moment ago, where Harmoed is translated Mount of the Congregation or Mount of Assembly and designates the mountain on which Solomon's temple stood to the north of ancient Jerusalem, Lucifer is represented as aspiring to replace God as Israel's sovereign ruler. Compare tabernacle to congregation. So what's happening here? Proponents of the first view of Armageddon consider the derivation to be from the Hebrew Har Megiddo or Mountain of Megiddo and interpret the name as it is used in Revelation 16.16 16, in terms of the geographical environment and historical associations of the ancient city of Megiddo. But it turns out, as we've already mentioned, Megiddo is not a, is not a mountain. It's not even close to a mountain. It's a hill, uh, basically a tell. You know, that those ancient tells where they would build one city and then when it got destroyed, they'd build another city on top of it. So it's an artificial hill. Proponents of the second view understand the first derivation figuratively, that is, in terms of the historical events of Old Testament history, associated with the vicinity of ancient Megiddo. See Judges 4, 5, 521 especially, and there's a bunch of references there. If you want to get our handout that we're getting all this from, it's, it's found on our website at www.theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Theox, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And you can see all these reference, references. But without attributing geographical significance to the term Armageddon in Revelation 16, 16, they understand the second derivation, Har Moed, figuratively also on the basis of its use 
in Isaiah 14, 13 in terms of the great controversy between Christ and Satan. And there's more references. And that's from the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 846. So what do you think? We should translate these verses geographically and very literally, or do we need to be taking a larger view? Much larger view. I think we need to remember Jesus who was telling the woman at the well, you won't be worshiping looking at this mountain or that mountain. You'll be worshiping him in truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Spirit absolutely. Truth. Yeah. You, you remind me, last night as I was studying for these classes, my son who's here visiting us and is very interested in some of the pictures from his childhood, came into my bedroom and says, take a look at these pictures. And lo and behold, there's a picture from 1972, no, 70, must have been 73, of our family coming out of the, the door. That go, now you have to take a, a stairway down to the well at Sychar. The, the woman at the well that you were just talking about, we were there and you know our, our kids were four or five years old, something like that, and there they are coming out of that, that very well. So, so now, should we take these verses very literally? We don't think so. Geographically, don't think so. It is important to notice that there are three frogs coming out of the mouths of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Now, what in the world are frogs doing coming out of people's mouths or even dragons' mouths? Well, one thing I wonder is that uh, frogs don't aren't born as frogs. They start off as tadpoles, which are relatively benign. Uh, frag frogs are sort of benign too, but they they go through a metamorphosis and become something else. So there may be something to that. Yeah. Okay. So they might may, be. They may start off looking very pleasing and and even and, like and a fish, change, and then they change. Mm-hmm into something else. So who are these dragon, beast, and false prophet? You're going to have to interpret Revelation 12 and 13 for me really quick. We're told just specifically in Revelation 12 that the dragon is Satan. Satan. Mm -hmm. And then we're told that the beast, the first beast, this, what's called the sea beast sometimes, gets his power from who? Satan. From the dragon, which is from Satan. So these must be earthly entities of some kind that are aligned with Satan, right? And then what about the false prophet? Where did that thing come from? It's the land beast, which we often interpret as the United States. Hmm. A false prophet? <laughs> well, it leads them to, to worship the image set up by the beast. So That's all, what it does, isn't it? Could you be? <laughs> well, we're quite certain that this, these three beasts here very clearly refer to those three beasts we early spoke about in Revel earlier spoke about in Revelation 12 and 13. So the word Armageddon almost certainly refers to an expression found in Isaiah 14, 13, where it is sometimes translated Mount of Assembly. However, clearly that Mount of Assembly in Isaiah 14 refers to a place in the far north where they believe the gods assemble. And what mountain is it talking about in Isaiah 14? Do you remember? Well, think about Mount Hermon was the biggest thing that they see from there. Well, but, that, but look, look at the look at the verse starting with Isaiah 14 verse 12, King of Babylonia. Oh, we're talking about Babylon, aren't we? Bright morning star. Is there another way we can express bright morning star? Lucifer. In Latin, that's Lucifer. You have fallen from heaven in the past, you conquered nations, but now you've been thrown to the ground. You were determined to climb up to heaven. What kind of places do you climb up to? Mountains, right? And to place your throne above the highest stars. You thought you would sit like a king on that mountain in the north where the gods assemble. And there's the expression right there, Harmoed, for Armageddon. You said you would climb to the tops of the clouds and be like the Almighty, but instead you have been brought down to the deepest part of the world of the dead. Do we think that there's going to be an all-out battle at the end over who's going to win in the great controversy? Absolutely. No question about it. 
will it be a physical battle? Well, that's what we, that's the if question. If people we are going to be killed, then there must be some. I mean, it's not may not be everybody in the whole world, you know, in some place, but uh, in places around. Let's do something really terrible right now for just a moment. Try to think like Satan. What would he like to accomplish at the end of this Earth's history? Do as much damage as he can, even he, he wants to eliminate the human family. Yeah, well, at l what he would ideally like, I think, he would like to eliminate all of God's people, yes. and then he would like to say to God, okay, back off. You can have the rest of the universe, but just give me this world. This will be for me and my people. Leave us alone. So who will he be trying to destroy? God's people. We have lots of evidence that he's trying to destroy God's people, don't we? You know, we, we talk about people being thrown in prison, people being destroyed in various ways. Well, he doesn't want a remnant. No. To demonstrate or to vindicate the word of God. Absolutely. That's the last thing he wants. Because of what reason? That would be curtains for him, right? I mean, if, if, if a group of people stand up, very clearly say, this is what we believe about God, this is the truth about God, all of Satan's accusations and, 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 and character assassination kinds of attempts are false, and God says, okay, these are my people here, <clears throat> Satan's finished. I mean, that's, you know, there's a thousand years still, but as far as official time where people can make choices, it's done. I think Satan is really worried about curtains. Would you be? Well, that's that's me, but it's not Satan. We got we need to figure out who he is. You, you don't think he wants to survive? Well, look, if you look, look at yourself. Well, yeah, you would do well, that. But but what what has Satan been doing for the last two thousand years? Everything he's he trying possibly. to raise a, ki a kingdom of death. That's well, what I think. Whatever so, you want to call it, I I, I don't think there's any any hope he's got to have a kingdom around he's, with he God. He tries to attack the new Jerusalem when it comes down at the third coming. Mm -hmm. He's still, he's insane. Well, now you're, you're making it look like a normal battle. Well, it, 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 well it, it, that's what Satan would like it to be. He would like it to be and a normal. You just said it was. <laughs> Well, I mean, basically, that's what, the, that's what the Bible describes. At the end of the millennium. Yeah, at the end of the millennium. I'm talking about that one, that time. Yeah, they, yeah but even before that, because Jesus says, I'll cut short those days for fear that there would be no one left alive on yeah. earth. What does that tell us? <laughs> There'll be a lot of deaths. So Satan basically wants to get himself, put himself up there on an equality with God. And he does not care who gets in his way. So, this well, greatest... That definitely was true before. Yeah. But I wonder about the second time. Yeah. So. Well, if you go back to those verses in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, who is it that lives in that place where Satan's supposed to, was trying to get to? It's God. This is the place where God lives. We should remember that the word Babel, Babel, really means the gates of heaven. Mm -hmm. And these people wanted to create a way to get to the gates of heaven. Exactly. And uh, what happened instead? They got all confused. Yeah. Well, just to make it very clear, we're making it as clear as we can here, there is no place called Mount Megiddo. Megiddo, the Megiddo that we know geographically, is a small tell. It's in a very strategic location but it's in the valley of Megiddo, not a mountain of Megiddo. Well, some have tried to suggest that maybe it's, there's a reference to some other place not too far away. That would be Mount Carmel. What do we know? What happened at Mount Carmel? Elijah and his... And the prophets of Baal. Okay. Yeah. Remember that Elijah had... Jezebel. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I have to chuckle. I think about... Think about the, the, uh, the, the incredible irony of this whole thing. Elijah comes from east of, east of, the, of the Sea of Galilee. 
He's a wild man from the desert, what we would call him today. He walks across the territory, walks up to the capital city, walks in, he doesn't, he doesn't stop to let anybody ask any questions or whatever. He marches straight into Ahab's office, into his king's, right before him and says, there's gonna be no rain for the next three plus years until I say so. And he turns around and walks out and everybody is, <laughs> I mean, how did he even get to the... Exactly. He, you know, you're not supposed to be able to get into places like that. Security wasn't quite the same back then. <laughs> or maybe it was. Well, <laughs> is it... it is now. Yeah. Well, Peter walked out of prison, so... <laughs> yeah, well, that was... <laughs> yeah. God can... Obviously, protect, God can... Protect anyway. Elijah. Anyway, we know that three and a half years later, God says, okay, it's time to go back there. Elijah goes back. He runs into um, Obadiah, uh, one of the... I don't know what his official position was, one of the helpers of Ahab, and they're out searching all over the place to see if they can find any water, any rain, any grass that grows to try to keep the animals alive. And anyway, Elijah sets up the thing, says, we're going to go to Mount Carmel. Ahab, you come with all your 400 prophets of Baal and 450 prophets of Asherah. Meet me up there, and we'll, we'll find out who's the real God. And what did they do? I couldn't get anything to burn, <laughs> any quantity. Do, do you think that those 850 prophets had any question in their mind about what they would do as they were ascending that hill that morning? Yeah, we'll, we'll just dance around, and nobody will be able to figure out what we're doing, and we'll slip some fire in there. No problem, right? I mean, w here you've got one person, wa everybody's watching, but of course the real key person is Elijah watching. 850 people milling around? How could you, how could you keep them from sleeping, slipping some fire in there? Maybe God miraculously put that fire out. I, I think God kept them from getting any. What do you think they would have done to Elijah if they had gotten that fire started? Torn him apart. They would have torn him apart so fast you couldn't believe it. Well, we know that by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Elijah was making fun of them because they obviously hadn't accomplished anything yet. And then it was Elijah's turn, and he said, well, just to make sure that we're not being, doing anything funny, we're not cheating in any way, bring some water. Well, three and a half years of drought, where's the water? Ocean. Okay, Mount Carmel is right up on a hill overlooking the Mediterranean. You just have to go down the hill, get yourself some water out of the Mediterranean, back up the hill, probably had runners who did it for them. And they poured on buckets, and they poured on buckets, and they poured on buckets. And there was the sacrifice, and there was the wood, and there was the altar made out of stone, and there was the dirt. And Elijah knelt down by himself and prayed to God in heaven. And I don't know how God lit that fire. Maybe it was lightning, I don't know. But I, when it was done, what was left? Big A black there. hole in the ground. Everything was gone. And what did the people say? That proves the Lord is God. The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Yahweh is God. By the way, is that ever that kind of a thing ever going to happen again? Where people who are, don't really want to say something are compelled to say something because it's so true? Every knee shall bow. Every, every knee bow shall bow. Philippians gosh. two. Satan himself is going to be down on his knees saying, "Yes, God, you did it right." Not because he wants to say that but because the evidence is so compelling, there's nothing else you can say. Well, we've talked about Revelation 12 and 13 and 14. We've, we've talked about that both sides in this battle, both the devil's side and God's side, demand that people worship them at the, at, at the cost of death if they didn't. So what kind of a demand is that from God? Is, we don't think of we think of God as being very gracious, very generous. Well, he, he's giving them opportunity. It's like this boat that boat you're in is sinking. Take my hand if you want to mm -hmm. be saved. Um, yeah. So I mean, they, he's offering a choice. Um, he's, uh, it's not like he's demanding it necessarily. Mm -hmm. He's just mm -hmm. emphatically stating 
the reality of the situation. He's the source of life, and and uh, apart from him, there uh, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So, uh, jumping back to Elijah for just a moment, what did God tell Elijah to do with those prophets when the day was over? Take them down to the river and baptize them. Isn't that what he said? <laughs> Not quite. <clears throat> or was it take them down to the river and cut them up? Kill them? I'm sure that Elijah didn't do that all by himself. The whole group of people must have grabbed those people and took them down to the river and took them down probably to the ocean. And God says, I mean, Elijah says, we've got to get rid of these evil people. They're, they're, I mean, if you think about it, Jezebel, Ahab's wife, had gone to Israel with a specific challenge. She was the daughter of the high priest of Baal. She was an evangelist. She thought she was doing a great job over there in Israel. And all these people were working for her. So if you're trying to... what Was uh, Elijah commended for the work he did? It was shortly thereafter. He was afraid and took off, didn't yeah. he? Scared to death of Jezebel. Yeah. Yeah. Well, is that the way that God's going to deal with people that are not his? Well, let me read what it says. Yeah, that's a good them? question. You should ask that. Look at Revelation 19, 20 and 21. The beast was taken prisoner together with the false prophet who had performed miracles in his presence. It was by those miracles that he had deceived those who had the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped the image of the beast. The beast and the false prophet were both thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. Does that sound like a good plan? Well, there's no swords here. They're just <laughs> well, these, uh, this is the, the uh, lake of fire is the second death. It, it says, I think, in the next chapter somewhere. Uh, and the false prophet and, and the beast are, are, are... You. Yeah, in other words, it's talking about symbolic beings. Okay. It's not talking about... And then death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire. You. So there's, it's not just a, a material kind of okay. fire. Um, the lake of fire is God's, God's presence, isn't it? You people failed the test that you're always supposed to notice when you read a passage of Scripture. What is the context? Yes. Look at the very next verse. The ar their armies were killed by the sword that comes out of the mouth of the one who was riding the horse and all the birds and all they ate all they could of their flesh. What does that mean, though? Well, a sword it, coming out of your mouth, that sounds like words. Yeah. Okay. So how do, you, is. how do you kill people with words? And, and who, is, who is the man riding on the horse who's, who has a sword coming out of his mouth? Well, the one that walked the earth using words, too. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's why God works. He's a teacher, not a penalty payer. We don't, know how, we don't know exactly how this kills people, but it's clearly, it's, it's somehow by, by the Word of God. Mistranslated, we say it's judgment, but really it's a separation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's done. You, you, we do it ourselves. People do it themselves. It's not God. God cannot take to heaven people who are would just start the great controversy in heaven all over again. We, he just he just can't take those kind of people to heaven. Well, on uh, the other hand, sh how should we understand the image of the beast? It's the image of the beast that is destroyed. Yeah. What is the image of the beast? Its message. Yeah. <laughs> That's, That's right. Yeah. We know that there is no other way to be saved except through Jesus Christ, Acts 4, verse 12. All false isms or religions in one way or another downplay the role of Christ on trying or try to eliminate him completely from their thinking. So what do we see happening in the minds and hearts of men in our world today? Are Christianity and Christ taking a major role in humanity's thinking? They're trying to do everything they possibly can to get rid of Christ out of their thinking. Are we seeing the beginnings of the collusion between the major religious powers and political entities? How will that work out over time? Remember that beasts in the Bible generally mean religious political combinations that seek to exert power over others, forcing them to worship themselves or their systems. So what have we learned about Armageddon? The Hebrew word means mount of assembly. 
It will involve individuals all over the world, and it will be the final battle between the forces of God and the forces of Satan. Even though we are primarily talking about an event that happened just before the second coming of Christ, that same conflict will be replayed at the end of the millennium, with Satan making his last-ditch attempt to attack and conquer the city of God, which will have come down from God out of heaven. What kind of weapons will they use? We don't know. It has something to do with the sword that comes out of the mouth. And we know that we're fighting against principalities and powers, don't we? Ephesians 6. How can we prepare ourselves? Well, some of you might have some questions in your mind about the great controversy. What is, is that really found in Scripture? Because a lot of people don't think great controversy is in Scripture. Well, I would suggest you go to our, our website, www.theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, and go down through the sections there and look under teacher's guides, look for something called the great controversy described in Scripture you might be surprised at what it has to say. And if you get our website, if you go to our website, I mean, if you go to our, this handout, the link will be right there. Take you straight to it. Well, have we had an opportunity now to carefully think through in our minds what these beast characters refer to, um, what it might Im imply about the times of, at the end? Um, do any of these alternative kind of religions make sense to you? I'm going to ask you to think one more time like Satan. What do you think Satan thinks when he reads the stuff we've been talking about, about his demise at the end? In a state of denial. <laughs> he, he, he wishes he could rip it out of the Bible? He thinks he'll get away from that. He'll find yeah. a way out. Yeah. Well, we know that the Bible describes a great final conflict that comes together here and and one of the very interesting things, and we're going to talk about that more next week, in Daniel 2, what destroys those four kingdoms in Daniel 2? Rock. A stone that is carved out of the mountain without the help of a single human hand. And what does it do to those kingdoms? Crushes them all. Crushes them all, and they result, what's left of them is blown away like the chaff in a summer wind, right? So it's all over. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of studying these words of these, and these ideas. May we come to understand them clearly so that we will not be confused or, or deceived during Satan's last final effort to deceive everyone he possibly can. May we not be in any way led astray is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.